decided to follow Jesus. I have decided Now presenting Gospel Restoration with Dempsey Williams from Montana Street Church of Christ. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our weekly or bi-weekly program. This week we continue our study of the Old Testament. We're taking you through chronologically the order of the stories as they appear in the Bible. And we last talked about King Saul. The time before that, the time after that, we talked about King David and his experiences so that you get an idea of how the Bible is laid out. This evening we're going to, to concentrate on David's son. His name was Solomon. He is called the wise man, the wisest of the wise. He was the third king of Israel, and he was a prophet as well. He wrote the book of, of uh, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, and the book of Proverbs, a book full of wisdom and wise sayings that you would do, do well to, to be well versed in. He was indeed known for his wisdom, and his wisdom came at a very early age. When Solomon was still a very young man, God appeared to him in a dream. I'm going to read you that account because God gave him a wish. You know, it's like the genie in the lamp. You rub the lamp and the genie comes up and says, Give me, tell me what your wishes are and I'll grant you three wishes. Well, this is pretty much what happened to Solomon. God appeared unto him in a dream in Gibeon. 1 Kings chapter 2, chapter 3, verses 5. And it says, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he, as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that, they may dis that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast not asked, because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lord, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart. So that there, are, there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then when I lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. So here is how Solomon obtained his wisdom. Of course, this is the same thing that we should do today. The New Testament, in the book of James, it says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives gifts and doesn't uh, upbraid or doesn't do anything underhanded, but will give you what you ask, especially if it's in the area of wisdom. So God has shown us uh, in his word that he is the source of all wisdom, and the wisdom that comes from God is superior to the wisdom of the world, wisdom of the earth, earthly and sensual wisdom. And this is the wisdom that we all should have for a long, a prosperous, and abundant life. Now this is an example in the Old Testament of how God spoke to men. 
in Hebrews chapter 1, it has this to say. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time passed under the fathers by the prophets. So this is an example of how God spoke to the prophets and how he spoke to the fathers in the Old Testament. But in this day and age in which we live now, listen to what the Bible has to say. But hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So we can see there is a difference. I mean, we're studying a time in Bible history when God spoke directly to men, but has in these last days spoken us to the, through Jesus Christ, his son. His son's spokesmen are the 12 apostles chosen by the Lord to shed light on the new and living way that is superior to the law and the Old Testament and the way God spoke to the prophets and the apostles in the old days. So Solomon was a wise man. He was allowed by God to build the beautiful temple, Solomon's temple. And this is uh, something that David wanted to do, but God would not allow David to build the temple because he was a man of war and he had blood on his hands. He had killed animals, wild animals, bears and lions, and he killed Goliath, the giant who would dare uh, walk and, and try to chide the children of Israel. When he faced the giant Goliath, he had a slingshot and one smooth stone. He took that slingshot and he threw a stone and it hit Goliath right, in, Goliath right in the middle of his forehead and he was knocked out cold. Then David went and took his sword and cut off Goliath's head. So he was a bloody person uh, from all of the lives that he had taken. So God would not allow him to build the temple. But he said, I'm going to let your son build the temple. Okay, Solomon is the son that was to build God's temple. He first had built a, a house for himself, pretty elaborate, because this was a period in Jewish history when they were very rich, very famous, and very powerful. So they had access to a great deal of, of material and craftsmanship that would allow Solomon to build the beautiful temple. The temple took seven years and 183,000 workers and skilled laborers to accomplish but it was a very magnificent site and, and building if you want to read a description of it and, and some of the details you go to first kings chapter 5 verses 13 through 16 it gives you a lot of details on what went into the temple of God Solomon ruled Israel for 40 years he was very famous for his wisdom the queen of Sheba came from the south to to have access to Solomon's wisdom and she said the half hasn't been told so we see that Solomon was, was well-renowned and well-known. Another example of Solomon's wisdom follows in the story where we had just been reading when Solomon was, was, came, was, was having a dream about God and God offered him these, this wish. In verses 16 of chapter 3 of 1 Kings, there's a story of two women who had children. One of them had uh, rolled over and smothered her own child, so she, she was living. Well, let me just read the story, and we can see here again God's wisdom coming through Solomon. Then there came two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. The woman said, O oh Lord, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I have delivered a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after I was delivered that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman child, woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. She laid on the baby and smothered it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I had bare. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living son is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the, the dead is thy son, and the, and the living is your son. They Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, the one, the one said, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other said, Nay, but this thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. So there's a great controversy between the one woman. One woman's child she had laid on and smothered him. So now she took the other woman's child and said, well, no, the dead child is yours and the living child is mine. So the king had to decide between these two women 
which one was the true mother of the living child? So the king said, verse 24, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The king said, divide the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. Wow. Then spake the woman whose living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned for her son. And she said, oh, my Lord, give the child, living child and, and no wise slay it. Give it to the other woman, even though she knew it was hers. She said, no, give it to the other woman. Don't slay it. But the other one said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go ahead and, and divide it and, and let it so that neither one of us will have a child. Then, verse 27, then the king answered and said, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. The woman just said, no, don't slay it, but give it to the other woman. I would rather sacrifice and give my child away rather than to have it to be executed and slain. So that's how the king, in his wisdom, determined whose child it really was. Verse 28 says, And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. So this is uh, the wise man who is um, able to discern good and evil, right and wrong, and through wisdom can accomplish and solve many problems. The problem, though, is Solomon came later on in his life. And in his old age, or later on in life, he began to acquire wives as he conquered these nations. And when you conquer nations, all of the animals, all of the stock, and even the women become the property of the conqueror. So Solomon ends up with 300 wives and 700 concubines. And this was a problem. First Kings chapter 11, we go a little farther in this same book. I'm going to read to you what happened. King Solomon, even though he was one of the wisest men that ever lived, it says that King Solomon loved many strange women. First Kings chapter 11. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Amorites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you should not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And herein lies the problem. Mixed marriages can cause the person to be drawn away after idolatry. And he, as wise as Solomon was, he took the chance, and he clave to these in love, verses 2 at the end. And he had 700 wives, princesses, <clears throat> and 300 concubines. I had that reversed. I thought he had 300 wives. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. My, my, my. And it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wife turned away his heart after other gods, and his, not, his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Milcon, the abomination of the Amorites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. So Solomon was corrupted and Solomon was ruined and Solomon was spoiled by the women in his life. You know, these were women who come from pagan cultures who had been worshiping idols all of their lives and when they married Solomon, they were able to influence him to do the same thing and worship idol gods. This is a huge stum this is still a, a huge stumbling block for people today who are attempting to follow the law with all of their heart. Your spouse can be a huge stumbling block if they are non-believers. That's why we are warned and forbidden and the practice is condemned of mixed marriages or marrying outside of the faith to marry an unbeliever in particular. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verses 14, the New Testament that applies to us with full force says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? See, this is the same God that, that, that Solomon was tempted and to worship is, is the pagan god of Belial and the other pagan gods of the day. And what part he that believeth with an infidel, somebody that doesn't believe, with atheists. Should a Christian marry atheists? Not if they know 
what God's will for their life is. It should never happen. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. See, when a Christian marries a non-Christian, he is adding his body, which is the temple of God, to the body of a person who is the temple of the devil. And that is something that should not happen because we have no agreement with the temple of idols. And we are, as a temple of God, realize that God dwells in us and that we cannot be one flesh with harlots, immoral people, and idolatry, idolaters, people who worship idols. And what a temp, verse 16, let's see. Wherefore, I'll go back to 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they sh shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the un thing, unclean thing, and I will receive you. And we'll be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Isn't this what we want? This is the type of relationship we want with the Father. Galatians 3.27 says, We are all the children of God by faith. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When we obey the gospel, God gives us his spirit, and that's a part of God that's now inside of us. Therefore, we should be separate from the things and the people of the world and not allow them to influence us to be like them. We should be influencing them to be like us. But anytime you go into a relationship with anybody, whether it's business or marriage or social or any kind of project, there's always the chance that you might be influenced more by them than they are of you. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your fathers in heaven. But sometimes that light gets pretty dim when it's around unbelievers and pagans. And we want to be their friends and we want to associate with them and we want to, to be pals when we should be separate. We are a peculiar people. We are separated for God's service and for God's use. And this is what King Solomon, God had chosen him to be the next king. Yet he was easily corrupted by the influence of his many, many wives. Now, Solomon was king of Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. They were God's chosen people. They were only one. Everybody else was following idolatry and pagans and, and worshiping all of these pagan gods. And today, we are in the kingdom of God also. But now, the kingdom is no longer physical. See, Solomon was the king of a physical kingdom in a physical location, and he was the king. Today, we have... A king who is like David and like Solomon and like the, the, the different kings of old. Only our kingdom is spiritual. We are subject to the kingship of Jesus Christ who has gone back to heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father on high. But he, Jesus Christ, is our king. Our only, he's also our high priest. In Acts chapter 2, verses 30, it says that God would raise up Christ to sit on the throne of David. Now, in what sense or how should we interpret that passage? Is, is Jesus Christ now sitting on the throne in Jerusalem? Or is this something that's going to happen in the future like many people teach, that when the Lord returns, he's going to come back and he's going to sit on his throne in Jerusalem. He's going to rule a physical kingdom on a physical earth for a physical thousand years. Well... That's one way people look at it, and that's one way of interpreting the Bible, but I don't agree with that. I think that the Lord's church is a spiritual entity. It is not a physical place, and it is Christ has been raised to sit on the throne of David, and he is now sitting on the throne of David. The king simply is the one who has authority in the kingdom, who sets the rules and the guidelines and tells the subject of the kingdom how they should live their lives, the rules for life and the rules for business and the rules for everything. So we have, we're comparing the physical kingdom of Solomon and David and, and, and Saul to the spiritual kingdom of Christ. And when Christ was, had completed God's plan for redeeming man, 
Christ ascended back up into heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit back and, we, and the apostles began to, to preach the gospel and the church had its beginning in Acts chapter 2. But in that first gospel sermon, Peter makes the point that Jesus Christ is now sitting on the throne of David as we speak. And it is a spiritual kingdom and not a physical kingdom. Christ rules in his kingdom from the right hand of the throne of God on, on high. There is disagreement about the kingdom and the church. Some say that uh, it is not the same. But in uh, Matthew chapter 16, verses 18, Jesus is prophesying that, uh, that the kingdom was his, first of all. And he said, I, he said the words, I will build my church. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18. When Peter, he asked the, the apostles and his disciples, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? They always say, you're Elijah, or John the Baptist, or one of the prophets. Okay, and then he said, well, whom do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, or upon this confession of faith, on, upon the fact that he, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God, I will build my church. Future tense. The church didn't exist in reality at that very moment, but was something to come in the future. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the church and the kingdom, he's talking about the same organization, but he uses two different words. First, he says, I will build my church. And the church is the kingdom of heaven. Christ is the king, and the, and the church is the kingdom. The, Christ, the church is his body. The church is his bride. The church belongs. He's the head of the church. So the church belongs to him, but he told Peter, I will give thee the keys of the kingdom. He uses this word interchangeably. He could have very easily said, upon this rock I will build my kingdom, or upon this rock I will build the kingdom of heaven. They are interchangeable in this, in this passage. So he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So whatever the apostles deliver unto the saints is what God's will is for us. The apostles had the freedom to, and Peter in particular, had the blessed privilege of preaching, preaching the first gospel of sermon with the new terms of pardon from God. God's plan for all eternity was for Christ to give his life on the cross and set out this pattern of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ from the grave. So now Peter, that now that Christ has completed the plan, that he has been crucified, he has been the matchless lamb of God that takes away sin of the world, he has been the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice that takes away sin, now the plan of God can be preached. And it is begun in Jerusalem, where it was prophesied in the Old Testament that the word of God will go out of Jerusalem, out of Zion, and that all nations should be a part of it. This is something that the Jews didn't really comprehend or understand, that the Gentiles were supposed to be a part of this new and living way. But the plan has now been completed, and the apostle Peter was given the privilege. This is when Jesus, Jesus promised him in Matthew 16, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Now, Peter is about to use the keys in the, to allow the first lost souls to be forgiven of all their past sins and to, to begin this new life as a Christian. So, the church is... Christ's body. And Peter was privileged to give the first sermon which contained the keys. And what were the keys? Acts chapter 2 verses 38. He told those people that they had crucified the Lord. He, in verse 36 then, that therefore let all the house of, uh, of Israel know surely that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. Now when the, these people heard this they, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this unto generation. So here Peter is using the keys. 
you know what the keys are and you can use the keys. The keys are the same. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's very important that we receive this gift of the Holy Spirit because it helps us and enables us to live the life, the Christian life. And we, it allows us to bear fruit. The love, the joy, the peace, the self-control, the temperance, patience, kindness, and all of those things that we have. We cannot have any other way except God give us his spirit. And he only gives us his spirit when we obey the gospel, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. So we can see that the kingdom and Christ have been prophesied from as long as there have been prophets. Not only did Solomon, but Isaiah. We'll talk about some of these prophets next time. How these prophets really support our preaching of the gospel because they have detailed elements of Christ's life, detailed elements about the church, detailed elements about the Christian uh, way and the things that would happen and uh, how uh, the church would begin and the details about Christ and what he would do how he would be born, how he would be crucified, how he would live. His, even his entrance into Jerusalem on the donkey was all prophesied and predicted before it happened so that we would have this evidence to support our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That is the most uh, important point that we need to realize, that we don't live under the law of Moses because the law of Moses was inferior to the law of Christ in that it had an inferior priesthood and it had an inferior high priest because when he died they had to get a new one. We have a high priest that will never die again. He's already tasted of death once for every man. So now it is no longer, our high priest will no longer die. He will always be in heaven at the right hand of God interceding for us. That's what a high priest does. So we have a better high priest. We have better promises. It's not, we're not promised a, a special land, physical land here on earth, but we are promised that one day we can reside with the Lord in heaven with Jesus Christ and with all of the saints of all periods because when Jesus died on the cross, his blood went backwards as well as forward to each and every one of us. So it is a blessing to be in the kingdom of Christ, to be a part of the body of Christ, to be able to approach God in prayer because we have been sanctified and set apart and for God's use, and now we as priests and, and kings before God are able to go directly to God in prayer. So hopefully you've had a little, you will have now a little better understanding of this principle of the kingdom and the church and how they relate and how we fit into the picture and how these things in the Old Testament are a shadow of the good things to come, which is Christ and his church. Everyone should be a member of the body of Christ. This has been Gospel Restoration with Dempsey Williams from Montana Street Church of Christ. 